If you want to learn how to gain insights you can act on and solve business problems with data, all while building a data-driven culture at your organization, sign up for Pragmatic Institute's new course, Data Science for Business Leaders. Find out more at pragmaticinstitute.com slash data. And so today we are going to share a story of how Nick Karochnikov, the head of data science at ShipBob, and Peter Bradford, uh, Pragmatic Institute's Director of Enterprise Transformation, really forged a relationship between data practitioners and product management folks to create this really beautiful cross-functional team that skipped ahead of the competition. Nick is the head of data science at ShipBob. He's an incredibly accomplished data science leader in the space and has an extensive track record of developing artificial intelligence and machine learning solutions to really transform business processes. Peter is Pragmatic Institute's Director of Enterprise Transformation, and he's really market-focused, totally outcome-driven, uh, and, and a product leader who has over 20 years of experience growing profitable businesses. Nick and Peter know each other well. They worked together previously at IBM, and these two fellows are just brilliant professionals, really elevated practitioners of their respective crafts. Um, so I cannot wait a second longer. I'm going to pass it right over to them. Uh, you are going to love hearing from them both. Nick, Peter, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you Nick. so much, Georgina. Take it away, Nick. Thank you, Peter. So um, I think the data storytelling is very powerful. So let me just start by sharing a little story. So personally, I have a tremendous respect for Facebook research. As some of the world's most advanced AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning algorithms came directly from the team. We use them on a daily basis. They are ranging from nature language processing to the most sophisticated big data driven recommender systems. On the background, these algorithms enable the core functionality of the meta products from image recognition to the news feed recommendations that you'll see in your daily usage. So a lot of those algorithms are now open sourced and data scientists across the globe are using them to do a variety of tasks, like detect objects and images, translate, summarize, generate text, build uh, very intelligent conversational AI agents, and transcribe text from speech. However, the irony is that this simple scorecard and a presentation from the data science team to uh, Meta's chief product officer, Chris Cox, it drove perhaps the most pronounced shift in the company strategy, ultimately leading to the renaming of Facebook to Meta. So what we can see from this leaked analysis, it demonstrated just one single fact, is that the teens and young adults are shifting away from Facebook and Instagram to alternative platforms like TikTok and Snapchat, and urgent actions are needed to maintain the growth. So to me, this portrays a quintessential partnership between the data science and product management teams. It enables the company to act rapidly on the data-driven insights. It can help adjust to the shifts in consumer preferences, maybe changes in competitive environment, macroeconomic pressures, recessionary pressures, geopolitical environments. But the bottom line is it does not have to be very sophisticated. It just has to be powerful enough to drive the change. So Peter, back to you. That's great, Nick. Well. Some of you don't know the backstory, but Nick and I, when we were at IBM, we were part of the enterprise transformation team working for the CFO. And we had the this amazing opportunity to um, collaborate successfully on a, a project for all of the for the benefit of all the product uh, development teams. We senior executives across our software, hardware, and services team wanted to surface best practices to drive their teams with speed and effectiveness, but they didn't want any investigations from our enterprise transformation teams slowing down the commercialization process. So we banded together and the project involved benchmarking roughly $6 billion worth of spending and 45,000 people engaged in commercializing new technologies to significantly um, look at different approaches to innovation. 
the constraints that we not talk to the product development teams except to evaluate our final results ended up inspiring a much deeper collaboration of both systems of record that house this the sanctioned and governed corporate data with systems of engagement that contains socially shared posts about work and jobs. And it also helped fuse my product management context heavy mindset with a much more savvy and deep exploration of data embodied by the work and insights of, of Nick. So let me say a few words. Um, think about, we have 45,000 developers, as, people, as Peter mentioned, $6 billion of spend. Now think about those people are describing the activity using a free form text. And to add the complexity, a lot of those people came from hundreds of different acquisitions that IBM has made across the globe from a variety of uh, startup technology companies or even some more mature enterprises. So now our goal is to find how we can make software development more effective. Um, and the way we wanted to approach it is by leverage the machine learning and nature language processing to standardize all of the jobs and tasks and measure really how much money, how much time we invest across each of those activities, because ultimately we wanted to learn from the best and apply to the rest. Thinking about those definitions, now that we standardized it, uh, spending weeks and weeks and weeks of mining through hundreds of thousands of different pieces of text, how people describe their jobs uh, on their personal uh, pages on, and their social media, like internal social media within IBM, we could start assessing the best practices. So we're running various simulations and comparisons between the most productive and the least productive teams. And uh, on those dashboards, you can see some of the sneak previews of those. Um, so we could provide actionable insights across a variety of dimensions. We looked at the team with a, a high attrition, low attrition teams that were very effective and were able to break down the team composition between most junior and senior resources, whether employees need to be co-located within the same geographical um, area or a time zone, and whether the most productive teams were the most compensated teams as well. And then uh, the crown jewel uh, on top of this, on the next page, we're actually able to protect the uh, intellectual property behind this novel approach. We were able to file an invention disclosure and uh, uh, we were actually granted a patent. So um, it was a good reward for us for all the hard work we spent on it. And that was, that was terrific. But you know, of course, this is just one example of many more public collaborations going on in the industry between data science and product innovation. For example, at USAA, telematics en enables the insurer to you know, nudge customers to be better drivers by offering rebates on insurance premiums. And judging from the popularity of those programs across the insurance industry, many cost-conscious consumers see those programs as win-wins. Um, you're probably familiar at Netflix, they built a strong and robust business uh, model over many years around the recommendations uh, based on views and reviews of movies. So if you have a subscription like Netflix or Amazon Prime Video, chances are you've you know, been encouraged to watch a program based on their recommendation engine. Over time, these have become increasingly accurate and they now drive, at least for Netflix, a 93% retention rate. Um, Airbnb similarly is using A-B testing, image recognition, natural language processing to help improve their recommendation. They've really, all of these companies have really forged that data science into the experience of the product itself. And so by tailoring that content for an audience of one, they're driving these transaction rates higher. And that increases, at least in Airbnb's case, the commissions from the exchange that they've helped enable. You don't have to go for too far from your daily activities if you're a product manager on the product team though, to get value from data science. You can put data science to good use in service of things as fundamental as market problems, which we talk about all the time in pragmatic training. Um, and as I did for uh, a needs analysis that I did for a new hardware platform a decade ago, one of the questions the instructor's report that is most often asked is how many Nahito interviews do I need to do to cover the market? And that's actually been answered by 
market researchers. Uh, Abby Griffin and John Hauser, academic researchers in marketing science, found that new insights gathered tend to asymptotically taper off as you do more and more. So you get about 80% of the information from qualitative interviews with about say 14 to 16 and approaching around 90 to 95 with 20 to 30, 25 to 30 discussions. Of course, the, the explorations should be about a specific problem or job to be done, but they're fairly robust numbers, at least based on the research. So we did uh, qualitative interviews, and then, uh, of course, like many of you, went on to quantitative. And so in order to prioritize requirements, you in, in order to get a sense of per, what's pervasive and urgent, you can do a quantitative survey. And that's complementary to the qualitative gathering of needs um, in that it helps you identify prioritizations, right? So with about 30, you can have a general sense of what the needs of a particular um, market are uh, for, for your innovations. But in that case, you know, at least at the, at the sample of about 30, you're not allowing for significant variations in job role. And so often you're only uh, identifying the high level opportunities, use cases that you typically find pretty well covered in some of the analyst recommendations, at least for the larger industry. So certainly feedback at this level is improving on what you got from the qualitative interview, but it's not something necessarily that'll keep uh, create a long sustainable advantage. Um, to do that, you, you can actually collect more responsive. And this is where I think data science comes into uh, or can come into uh, your market um, gathering your key problems and understanding your market. And, and in this case, we gathered roughly 235 um, individual responses and you can do clustering analysis. So, you know, for those of you that are less familiar with that, you, you identify patterns of responses across the, the data set and by leveraging um, clustering analysis, you, you can identify groups that have more or less answered the survey in, in a similar way. And by doing so, you can identify needs-based segmentation or create needs-based segmentation and create a prioritized backlog for a specific market segment. And that enables you to, in this case, you can see have much greater focus on uh, a segment that offers sustainable differentiation, and you can create personas that help your entire product team focus on those individuals with specific needs. So product managers and data scientists are clearly birds of different feathers, but there's there's a lot of value in that collaboration. Nick, wouldn't you say so? I think that uh, outside of this meta Facebook example that we shared, how often do we really see product management teams that are meeting with the data science on a cadence basis? And how many product managers are looking at those health scorecards the data scientist team putting in front of them? So I think that collaboration is critical. So now if we think about traditional application of data science, and we kind of wanted to highlight some examples from different business functions, they, they are maybe a little bit more uh, mature, right? For the human resources, we wanna minimize the employee churn, we wanna be able to really stop employee from churning a few seconds before uh, they make their decisions by uh, being able to uh, proactively intercept the churn and, and maybe offering them a better position, better compensation, better training. Um, for the sales, it's very common. Uh, obviously, sales organizations are all interested in how can we increase the revenues how can we improve the coverage? How can we better identify uh, prospective buyers and the right offering for those prospective buyers? For the marketing, it's the, what campaigns are most effective? How do we convert more leads? How do we identify the most effective communication and the right sequence for those communication? Do we first touch uh, a, a, a prospect or a customer with an e, uh, maybe with a social media touch, then maybe direct mail, maybe the, the, the postcard, then a follow-up conversation. Now for the legal, uh, it's either minimize the likelihood of lawsuit, or maybe we want to identify companies who are infringing on our intellectual properties. 
Um, for the finance, uh, we don't want to default. We want to identify who is at risk of maybe skipping a payment to us. And for the support, um, I think today we see a lot more AI-driven support. Um, the, the, the very basic idea behind support might be um, we want to prioritize the requests from a customer set risk. So let's say if you identify the customer with a high churn risk score, you want to be able to send them to your best, most uh, proficient support group so they can take the best care. Maybe for the customers who have a very basic question, you use AI to automate to answer it. And then for everyone else, they will supply. So I think those business functions have plenty of examples of existing data science solutions. Uh, but to me, uh, the, the product managers are somehow missed from that uh, page. Well, I, you know, I think I, we, all of those are kind of uh, operationally focused. And, and Nick, maybe that the reason is because that um, there's an obvious ROI with some of those cost functions, um, you know, it's if I if I kind of look at it from a product management perspective, it's not that product managers don't want that collaboration to happen. It's just that organizationally, I feel like the, the they're on islands in many cases and separated. And so when I see product managers and product team members kind of leveraging analytics, it's usually um, the most creative way. Um, they can through the use of tools to help extend their expertise in areas where you know they 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 don't really have a um, a resource a physical data scientist to interact with, um, and so um, they you know tools like Amplitude, Mixpanel, Pendo, and Heap you know they track user interactions, usage, visits and specific events and those provide descriptive analytics about user behavior and they help identify specific pain points in the journey and then quantify the overall user experience. Of course, you know this so these are this is great for developing deeper insights into that journey, um, helping to um, improve the design of interfaces, understanding when the users are getting stuck drive that engagement and further adoption um, uh, with SaaS uh, software in particular, but it doesn't necessarily lead to these, these, these greater gains that you know, we're seeing the examples of um, functional product outcomes, prescriptive analysis, artificial intelligence automation, or necessarily introduce new business models. So I think there's an opportunity for um, a new path, you know, kind of this more direct product management to data science team collaboration to improve product innovations, kind of like the experience that we had uh, many years ago working together. And, um, you know, it's it, it requires, it's going to require some movement on both sides, you know, Um from, from the perspective of the overall model, it's it's no different than product innovation itself. You know, there's, um, many of you are probably familiar with the double uh, diamond uh, of, of innovations where, you know, starting from articulated needs, you're going to first take that journey, that, that divergence and convergence from zero to one to identify that specific valued uh, innovation. And in this case, we're creating an analytical insight. And so when, for example, Nick and I worked together, that first proof of concept was very similar to what I engaged in with uh, engineering teams, where we identified a capability that we, a solution that we could deliver, in this case, uh, a specific analytics insight. And then, and then there's a little bit of divergence and convergence. Okay, how can we scale and productize this or, or make it work such that it's not going to cost us um, exorbitant amounts uh, as we deploy it across the rest of the business. Ultimately, you know, that requires, I think, product managers to become more data fluent and data scientists, as I observed, um, Nick, as, as he was developing in our collaboration to become more savvy from a business acumen standpoint, better at storytelling, telling, um, you know, the, the story of the data in the context of the users. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's certainly foundational. Um, 
bringing data scientists and closer collaboration with the product teams will help. So if you're not, you're not in charge of a formal program yourself, I think you can engage in informal exchanges. One of the um, one of the occasions that I had to, as a product manager, engage with many data scientists was this data hackathon related to customer needs. And I thought that was really a valuable um, uh, experience for both the data scientists and the product managers that, in, that uh, joined that. It was a lot of fun too. And then, you know, you can develop structures and boundary artifacts that inspire that closer collaboration. So you can do as a product manager, a data inventory. What, what data do you have, you know, as you're creating your product roadmap um, and you're thinking about the experiences that you're trying to create for your targeted user base, you know, what are the fundamental questions that you have at each of those major stages? And what are the date, what are the, pieces of data that you have and don't have. Typically, when I observe transformations or breakthroughs in innovation, it's really about kind of pushing towards the data that quite simply you, you just don't have or you don't know that you have. Um, and um, pairing up with a data scientist, sharing that data inventory, sharing that product roadmap strategy and your measurement challenges is a great way to engender, I think, uh, some, some fantastic collaboration. So, you know, as you think about the, uh, the framework, you know, the 37 boxes, there's plenty of, of areas that are ripe for collaboration that, you know, with data could be so much more rich and driven by market needs and you know ultimately help you make better decisions what i would say is you know there there there's some areas where you know it's it's going to be heavy on you as the the product team leader uh you in a spreadsheet you know on the flip side there are some projects that you know the data science team is going to engage in and they're going to be really outside the scope of you know, uh, new product creation. But there's probably a fair bit of common ground in the middle where there, there's an opportunity. It's not, it's not incredibly complex, but it's more than you can do with your spreadsheet. And with just a little bit of effort from your data science team, you could realize a tremendous win-win. What do you think, Nick? Uh, so what I wanted to do, I wanted to start this page by maybe encouraging people to ask more questions. And I, I already saw one from Eric, and maybe I'll try to kind of cover the question as well as uh, go through some of the things that are written on this page. So to me, uh, the, the data is probably more readily available than you think. We do a lot of the social media mining. We do a lot of the voice of customer through a variety of NPS scores. And you personally, I, when I first started, I was surprised how many data points we can collect from just publicly available sources. There are places like G2, I think used to be called G2 Crowd. Um, there are uh, product review boards. There are social media and open Facebook pages. There are all of the consumer reports. So I, I think to me, it's, uh, there are scrappy ways to engage with your customer base and collect what they have already provided. Um, they might be a little bit biased, but uh, I think that data is infinitely better than no data at all. So now if I think about those project ideas for, for the existing project, for the existing product, collecting those health scorecards, I think the critical piece here is it's not enough to just take the number. So let's say your customers uh, might be rating you as all five, but what does it really mean? Um, in, in my uh, professional history, I worked on a, a project where we were collecting the customer satisfaction reviews from the uh, customer briefing centers. And most of them were rated as fives or fours. So um, customers were happy. And what the briefing management team decided to do, they said, look, we're not going to bother reading through the comments that have fives or fours. They're all pleased, right? What are we going to change? 
But when we opened up the scan of worms and start, started running some natural language processing algorithms through this data, we found out that a lot of the comments would say the meeting facility was fantastic. The chairs were comfortable. The food was delicious. The drinks were uh, plentiful. But your presenters were gods awful, right? So like, wow, because they felt that they're rating the facility if they're not rating the content. So, so like those things are extremely valuable. And so to me, if I look at the brand health scorecard, it's always a combination of multiple data dimension. Is what you're hearing internally from your stakeholders, what are you getting as the kind of financial results, product usage, product engagement, uh, obviously the revenue data, profitability data, but all of the data you collect from the kind of external places by reading and, and listening and feeding the results for the social media are absolutely critical. Um, so now the market need for the new product. So I think that's a lot more difficult because it's easy to say what is your product doing versus uh, to try to estimate what would your product have done if I were to create it. So there is a lot more conceptual analysis will have to go, but maybe we can do some cluster analysis on the needs of our stakeholders, various personas, a lot of the public opinion mining. Um, one more time, the data is, is really available on a lot of different uh, uh, outlets, uh, B2B or social media outlets, competitive intelligence. Um, so for example, if you're thinking about creating a new product, maybe the first thing is to go and uh, collect the data from your competitors offering. Maybe there are a lot of the customers who like certain features and functions and totally can stand the other features and functions. So that's an opportunity to collect this data and create a better offering. So then forecasting and the projections. So uh, right now, I think everyone is asking a question. Uh, so what is going to happen by the end of the year? Are we going to be in a recession? Where the market is going to be? Um, and, and honestly, if I could tell you what's going to be the price of S&P 500 six months from now, I would never have to work again. But we still have enough data to be able to estimate something and, and be able to at least create a, the, the simulation scenarios, right? If consumer confidence shrinks by 5%, that's what's going to make what's going to happen to our revenue and profitability. So I think having some at least high level simulation capabilities are critical for you to make more uh, future proof decisions, right? You can say, we're gonna hunker down, uh, we're going to um, cut 20% of our staff and, and we're going to uh, weather the storm. But you might say it's an opportunity for us. We believe that if we continue investing over the next 12 months, while the rest of the competition is completely cutting the spending, we're gonna come so much stronger because we'll, do, we'll have capabilities A, B, and C that the rest of the companies will simply not have. And we're going to crush the competition. And then the last piece is um, the, the customer engagement. Um, I, would, I cannot tell enough about how important it is to set up those insights from the get-go. So getting those NPS scores, getting customer reviews, sending them some results, and then analyzing them. So my, my favorite example is uh, every time I would get uh, a survey from uh, my, for example, internet cable provider, I've never rated them more than zero, but they've never acted on any of the insights that they provided. So like, what, what's the point? They're collecting the data, obviously they're not acting on it. So if you choose to get this information from your customers, make sure that you have a team that is at least acting on those insights. And if they're saying they did not receive the right answer, if they needed additional help, if, um, if they rated you highly on certain elements, let's say maybe the customer uh, service rep was very friendly, but didn't know how to uh, provide a certain capability, let's follow up, let's engage with those customers. And it I think it does miracles. It improves the engagement, it improves the product usage, it reduces the customer churn, and it gives you so much more visibility into what customers are doing with your product. That's awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Dick. Those are some really great suggestions, um, and I think that absolutely does uh, answer um, answer the question that Eric had for us and give give a couple examples and ideas. Um, this is a good time um, for others on the call to add questions uh, for Nick and Peter. Um, a couple of you did send me questions already, um, but the Q&A box is the best place for you to pop those. So I encourage you to use this opportunity to um, get some get some hands on uh, advice and ideas uh, from these two uh, brilliant fellows. So pop those into the Q&A box now. Um, I have a question uh, that I'd like to start with here. Um, 
that is really about how to start, right? People are like, yes, I, I definitely want to do this. It's a priority internally for us to create really strong relationships between product and data, um, but they really need a greater understanding of, first of all, what, what the data folks do, what they need from product and vice versa. So really creating that understanding. As someone is just on the beginning of this journey, what are some suggestions that you have for them to really introduce product and data teams to one another and say, this is what we do and what we need, and this is what we do and what we need. Um, Peter, do you have suggestions about that? Yeah, I'm of course more interested in what Nick has to say, but um, you know, from from a product standpoint, I you know I think it's 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 not such a bad thing to just kind of do a um, to canvas the role to to talk you know even within even within a business you know what I find is there's variation in terms of what people are doing. You know, so you can share a, you know, share a day in the life. And and what I would encourage is, you know, kind of an informal exchange, you know, take take a data scientist to lunch, you know, inter, become interested in what they're doing. I think the more interest that you display and, you know, and interest in common humanity that you display in, in reaching out, you can really get into some rich conversations, but it starts with the relationship. Um, and, um, and part of that, I think, is enabled by having a better understanding um, of the, the data scientists world. And so, you know, if you just research or um, uh, understand a, a few more of the, the terms of art and, and their, their world, You'll be able to, without interrupting them, listen to um, what they're working on and even be able to kind of ask intelligent um, second order questions. Yeah. What do you think, Nick? So I think what you said, I think inviting the data scientists to your next team meeting and let them the first 30 minutes, let them listen what you do. And for the next 30 minutes, ask them to think and, and, and share the opinion of what they can do to help you out. So I know in a lot of the organizations, uh, if you have an existing data science team, they might be very technical and they people who might be lacking the business understanding and visibility into the product that the product team offers. So I think it, it's, a, it's a partnership. Uh, inviting data scientists for lunch or buying them a drink, I think is a sure thing, a sure way to develop this collaboration. If you live in a, if you work in a remote environment, uh, buy them a virtual uh, coffee or, or tea gift card, maybe. Uh, I think the, the, the bottom line is data scientists want to help. They want to gain business knowledge. They want to gain business understanding. They want to make sure their work is impactful because the last thing you, like as a data scientist, the most demotivating thing is what we call creating the shelfware, building things that are sitting on the shelf collecting dust. And for us to make sure that what we build is actionable is exactly the collaboration with the product team. The product team knows maybe they, they're evaluating some possibilities. They're thinking about what features, functions the customers would want, what product to deprecate, what product to bring to market, what can you guys do? And of course, in every organization, everyone is overworked and underpaid. Uh, so, but, but that's, I'm sure it's all a matter of prioritization, making sure that the business understands that we can only be successful as our product portfolio is. And then you guys have a direct dotted line to the product team, helping them understand how to prioritize. I think that's critical. I I am delighted to come to the product managers meeting because I learn about like what is coming this year, what is coming next year, how the project portfolio looking, what are the trade-offs? And I think being able to provide this um, eyes and ears and uh, even going back to the very simple product health scorecard and, and Facebook's examples, I think that's critical. Enabling product managers to, to make those data-driven decisions is absolutely critical. Yeah, 
Absolutely. There's another question that is similar to to some of the points that you touched on, Nick, in in really, um, but looking at it from the perspective of a, a leader uh, of the organization or of the team, and how can you really ensure that the product managers are taking the necessary time to loop in the data folks at the beginning of a project, right? If if the if the product folks are the ones that are driving a new project. Um, our, our question asker says that sometimes they feel as if their product managers will spend a long time working on a feature release and then loop in the analytics team at the very end saying, can I have some data here? Yeah, you know, to, to me, this is just indicative of the, the relationship that product used to have with the engineering team, you know, back in the days of waterfall, right? Um, we need to think of data science, and this is just, you know, my humble opinion, but I think we need to think of our data science team, much like we think of the engineering team today. They need to be brought into that collaboration early on as, you know, co-collaborators in, in understanding and developing um, insights about, you know, the, 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 the problem and the way in which we solve that problem, you know, the zero to one innovation creation, as opposed to just at the back half productizing or, you know, being farther downstream. And I think by doing that, we'll bring a lot more of those insights forward. I know, for example, by talking with Nick early on, I learned some things, you know, data resources that I had no clue about. And, and he knew ways of analyzing those data resources um, that transformed what was, you know, a confusing and quite overwhelming uh, mass of data into something that we could translate into something insightful, a plank, if you will, that brought in logic um, that really transformed how we, we solved a particular problem that we shared. So I, I think it's just about being invitational. Um, I don't know, Nick, any other things to add there? I might add just a little touch on this. I, I think the problem we're facing frequently is that the data science teams are brought up to fix the issue once it's about to fail. I think if we need to turn the tables and product managers should be making the decisions on priorities using the data and not the gut feel. I've heard from one of the product managers that it's more important to feel that you are right than actually be right. Um, because if you feel you're right, you're going to make, um, uh, you, you're going to, to follow uh, your strategy no matter what. So, so I, I personally would not support that position. I think being able to, and, and I cannot think of any organization, even the multi-billion dollar businesses that would have infinite amount of financial needs, right? So you always have to prioritize. You have to develop things that make more sense. So how do you make those decisions? And, and if the product team says that we, unless we understand the metrics, the metrics can be financial driven, usability driven, market driven, competitive driven, unless you have the number and the number probably will come from your collaboration with the data team or data science team, I think your gut feel uh, is not serving you very well. So I think uh, we want to be partnering with the product organization, uh, but uh, we want to be brought to the table um, um, at the day zero and, and not when it's too late. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to add one thing. I, I, you know, having said that, I think there, there are, you know, because of the frequency and the timing of decisions, Nick, I think there's different logic that can be applied. You know, there's deductive when you have all the perfect information you can, you know, follow the consequence of that. There's inductive, you know, trying to see the relationship. And then there's abductive, which is kind of like hypothesizing um, a relationship based on the evidence that's presented at the time. And I think, you know, a lot of times, given the, the time constraints that our product managers and product team members are under, Sometimes you just have to make the best decision with the best data that you have at the time. And I think I think you would support that too if you were in close collaboration. It's kind of like working together as long as we have, you know, we've made the decision on the, the best information we have today, we can continue to iterate and get better later, but uh, we're going to move forward. Yeah. You will never have 100% of the data. Never. 
So you will need to make a decision with uncertainty. And that uncertainty might be 20%, it might be 50%, but you still are certain that the other half of the decision is made is based on material data. Yeah. Yeah. I think that we have teased through a, a, some really interesting perspectives and valuable perspectives about where the relationship should begin. Um, there are two questions here about um, kind of the more formal structure of either those relationships or teams themselves. Um, so thinking about, uh, you know, what are some of the best team structures uh, that either of you have seen for product and data working together? What, did, what do those team dynamics look like? So if I were to answer maybe Nathaniel's question directly um, about whether it makes sense to place the data scientists within a product management team or rely more on a centralized data science function, I think it depends a lot on your team. So I've seen both approaches work very successfully. If you have a centralized data science function and one of the missions is to support the product, I think it's a little bit easier uh, because let's say some um, skill set might be required to do like computer vision, some skills for nature language processing, some skills for customer uh, attrition prevention. Uh, so to me, the centralized data science team will have a lot of sense because they might be able to pull through the resources to provide the support. Uh, but uh, in certain companies, um, it, it's working across organizational boundaries is difficult and you always get kind of this cold shoulder and, and for those types of organization, I think having a function within a business um, probably would be justified. So, um, and, and, and as I said, it works uh, both ways. And there are some companies that prefer this center of sex, centers of excellence where everything is centralized. There are other functions, I think Amazon has been known for it with the STO, STL, uh, single threaded ownership, single thread leadership organizations. The data scientists are embedded in each of the STLs. So to me, that's um, uh, it, it's an organizational decision and, and either of them can be very successful. Anything from you, Peter? No, I think that was that was exhaustive. I'm not gonna add anything <laughs> value add beyond that. That was great, thanks, Nick. Uh, there, so there's a question from Ganesh who's asking about, um, you know, really motivating an organization to have the data mentality. And then there were also a number of folks at the beginning of the call describing their relationship um, in, in their organizations between product and data saying that there is a top down mentality that's saying we value the data mindset, but the actual day to day relationships um, are not necessarily expressing themselves in that way. So, you know, on one hand, there's an organizational culture of, of data collaboration, but the personal relationships are still underdeveloped. And then on the other hand, sometimes you do have strong working relationships, but that kind of data mentality, as Kinesh says, isn't there. Can you talk a little bit about each of these challenges and scenarios and how coming together might look different depending on the situation? I think Ganesh's question is probably one of the most difficult problems because investing um, investing in the data is actually a significant uh, financial constraint, right? It, it's uh, even if you have perfect data today and, and you don't maintain it uh, in about five years, it becomes obsolete. So uh, being able to build the use case and uh, and and follow through this use case to continuously invest in upkeeping the high quality data that will drive, that will enable data scientists and will drive the right product decisions is, uh, is a budgetary item that needs to be um, in, in every single organizational plan. Um, do I have a, a hack through this? Can we say, well, no, we're not gonna develop and invest in our data, we'll find alternative means. I think the answer to this is no. So this this has to be uh, there has to be visibility across the leadership and investment in the data in a high quality data. I don't think uh, there is there is any way to bypass it. I've I've always believed that you know there's tops down leadership and then there's bottoms up influence, right? Uh, and I think cultural transformations and refocusing a team on you know kind of data driven insights can happen at at um, at both levels, you know, it, at some point in your career, I think you come to this point where you realize that the culture of an organization is 
um, you know, is is partially your beliefs about the culture. And so I really do believe that everyone can, you know, have a dramatic influence on the, the leadership team, whether or not they're in leadership, um, by simply living that passion that you have for data. And um, what I would say from a product management side is just be very, be very clear about the uncertainties that you have. One of the, I think the biggest challenges is um, particularly for people that have been a part of organizations a long time is understanding where their assumptions lie. And so you really have to be circumspect uh, about the assumptions that you're making about the marketplace, about the solutions that you're bringing. And, um, you know, there's no better way of I think, you know, kind of punching holes in your assumptions or at least developing clarity than kind of uh, looking at data, being refreshed by, you know, that user feedback and, and other insights, and then becoming very clear about the questions that you want to ask. It's, um, it's one thing to inspire the collaboration. It's quite another to ask a question that ultimately, you know, you don't have necessarily an action that you're going to to take. And so I think sometimes beginning with the end in mind can help you become even more data driven. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. As we're as we're wrapping up, I have one uh, kind of fun question. Um, recommended books for product teams that are starting to dig into data insights. Nick, do you have a book that you would suggest that people um, take a look at as they're just starting to um, get more familiar? I, I do not. Unfortunately, on the top of my head, I'll have to think about it. Sure. Any ideas, Peter? I know we're putting you on the spot. I have a, a few. I, I really like um, a book by Doug, Douglas Hubbard, uh, How to Measure Anything, because like the title says, um, you know, there's there's probably a, if you can think about a, a business problem, um, you know, probably the most transformative things for your, your customers, as well as internal operational practices are around things that you don't have measures for. And so, you know, it's, it's, if you can, if you think um, with the mindset that uh, Doug recommends in that book, I think um, that will inspire this collaboration with data scientists and equip you to kind of move in the direction of uh, a data-driven practice. So that would be the one that comes straight to the fore. Awesome, thank you. Uh, all right, closing question. Um, it'll be the same for both of you from two different angles. Uh, Peter, if there was one thing that product folks on this call would do um, once we wrap up here, uh, what would you suggest that they do? Um, and same, same question will come to you after Nick from the um, data perspective. I think, you know, the, the best thing that they can do is take an, take an inventory. You know, it's kind of like um, every once in a while, I think um, I, tr I try to think unconstrained um, in order to really have, you know, to, through that, that um, exploration, uh, some type of breakthrough insight. And so if you could have any measure uh, to in, improve the business, to inspire the next innovation, what would it be? And um, and don't just come up with one, come up with a list and, and use that as um, a collaborative document to inspire that collaboration with data-driven practitioners and the your extended product team. Um, you know, maybe that's a little impractical, you know, uh, but I think that um, certainly that would enable you to, um, to to really transform your practice and what you're doing. So anyways, that's the one that came to mind. Love it. What about you, Nick? I'd say go set up this lunch meeting with the data science team. Yeah. <laughs> Very practical. <laughs> Excellent. 
Perfect. Perfect. Thank you both so much for your time and your insights. There's already um, tons of kudos pouring into the chat for both of you. Uh, really appreciate your, your generosity of spirit and knowledge that you shared with all of us today. Thank you very much for walking us through this. It's been a pleasure, especially working with Nick again. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for the opportunity, Peter. Thank you so much for joining this episode of Data Chats. And to our listeners, you can harness the power of your organization's data with Pragmatic Institute's data course, Business Driven Data Analysis. Improve your data team's approach to analysis and stakeholder communication and empower them to drive business outcomes through critical insights. The upcoming open enrollment session of Business Driven Data Analysis runs from July 18th through September 7th with classes on Mondays and Wednesdays. Or speak to our sales team about scheduling a private training tailored to your team's needs. Learn more at pragmaticinstitute.com slash data. <laughs>